Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kristen. I'm the Director of Programming here at Northrop, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for the October edition of the Spotlight Series. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. The IAS acknowledges this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. The IAS is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. So the Spotlight Series is a collaboration between Northrop, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, and the University Honors Program. And we are presenting lectures, panel discussions, exhibits, and other events throughout the academic year around this topic of timely interest. The 2019-20 series focuses on environmental justice and features perspectives from a variety of voices in the field, including academics and practitioners from multiple disciplines. Campus leaders, artists, policymakers, and funders during the course of the year will be exploring several critical aspects surrounding the intersection of environment and equity. This particular discussion is around the arts and arts perspectives on environmental justice. The co-sponsors of this afternoon's event are the Department of Geography, Environment and Society, the Department of Theater, Arts and Dance, the Institute for Global Studies, and the Race, Indigeneity, Gender and Sexuality Studies Initiative. So thank you very much to all of our co-sponsors for this event. We are very fortunate to have with us three panelists from three different artistic disciplines from different parts of Minnesota. And they are Ananya Chatterjee, who's a professor of dance here at the U and artistic director of Ananya Dance Theater. Nancy Hernesma, an independent artist. Shanae Madison, co-founder of the Water Bar and Public Studio and Independent Artist. And they'll get a chance to tell you a little bit more about themselves as we go along. Um, but it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. Robin Robinson is a former news anchor, reporter, and candidate for Lieutenant Governor, who also served as art director of the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. She currently runs 5x5 Five Five Art Consultants and is also a respected jewelry designer. She is a Hubert Humphrey Public Policy Fellow at the University of Minnesota and is board chair of the Minnesota Museum of American Art. So please join me in a very warm welcome for our moderator and all of our panelists today. Thank you. And thanks so much for everybody coming out this afternoon. We know there are a variety of different things that you could have done this afternoon. Uh, but we think it's more important that you're here and really talk about the things that are closest to us, mindfulness, materials, and uh, our memories about what uh, is closest to us. So thank you for being here today. We're going to do something a little bit different as our panelists talk a little bit about why they uh, chose their professions. Uh, we are going to pass out some clay, thanks to Nancy. Now this is just an opportunity for you guys to kind of feel what we're talking about and really kind of do some textile playing and while you're listening. Uh, I have done exhibits in the past where you try to explain to people what is the connection that we Minnesotans really have. And it really is the earth. I think Minnesotans have this really great bond. It's like a bungee cord that snaps people right back to Minnesota and whoever is with them. That's how I got here. Uh, so I think that uh, there's a real passion and connection when you hear people talk about up north the lakes and the cabin, it really does mean something. So get some clay, pass it around, you know, share it with everybody. We also have cleanser, so if you want to <laughs> clean your hands off afterwards, you can. Uh, but I think this is a great opportunity to kind of really feel what we're talking about here, too. Uh, share with somebody, too, if you want to. So, you know. <laughs> but in the meantime, let's start with Nancy. And I, I, you know, we heard uh, that you are an artist, but explain really why the, the, the arts mean so much to you and the connection to environmental justice. Yeah. Um, well, I started out as, well, I guess I, I'll go back a little farther. I started out with a mother who was um, very artistic. So I was just inundated with art my whole life and um, went through some advertising programs and worked in advertising in the Minneapolis area and out in California when I was out there for a few years. And 
came back to um, Minneapolis, wound up in the Ely area, and um, wound up getting a job with the United States Forest Service as a wilderness ranger in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. I did that for 23 years, and it gave me a real strong sense of protecting the environment. A big part of my job was educating people and enforcing rules and regulations that pertain to wilderness. So I walked away with quite a strong ethic in Leave No Trace camping and what's entailed to try and change behaviors, try to get somebody to understand why we have this regulation and, and sit down with them and hopefully get some compliance with that. So that kind of morphed into <laughs> my retirement years, which have been seven plus now, and um, I've kind of gone back to my art and fell into uh, learning how to work with clay and took that one step further and started processing clay, which is what you're holding in your hands right now. This clay actually was dug from my yard and hand processed. It's quite an ordeal. It's not for the faint of heart, it's a lot of hard work. And granted, it would be a lot easier for me to go over to Continental Clay and for a few bucks buy 50 pounds of clay. But it's all about the process and taking the time as methodical as it is. It became a very spiritual connection with the land and that's kind of a big reason why I'm here today. So, thank you. Chinai. Should be on. <laughs> Hi. There you go. <laughs> Shanae. Um, so you want me to talk a little bit about? Give us a little bit of background. I mean, it's easy to say that you're an artist and what you do, but we kind of want to know how it, how it sure. got there, how sure. the process came to, for you. So one part of my story that's pretty important is that um, I grew up in a town of about 100 people in northern Minnesota on the Mississippi River. Um, but my relationship growing up with the river um, was not the same even though i was in a place that a lot of people think of as a place to go camping or to be outdoors we didn't actually do a lot of those things my family was very poor um we spent a lot of our time um doing what we had to do to survive i guess um but also having our own relationships with place and with land and with water um a lot of the work that i do as an artist kind of moves fluidly between a lot of different mediums i don't i think of myself as being somewhat of an undisciplined person um <laughs> and uh i write i'm a poet um i write about uh, my own experiences and also as a way to understand uh, my relationships with land and water and other people um, and place. I think about environmental justice um, as being, um, it's a very complicated thing. I don't like these textbook definitions. I think each of us is on a journey to f figure out what that means for us and where I'm at at this moment in time. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, someone who's a mentor to me and I was explaining to her how I just feel so much rage <laughs> lately um, and also grief. And these are feelings that we don't like to talk about in Minnesota, <laughs> in public places. And so I'm gonna put them right here. <laughs> um, but what she said to me that I think pertains to this conversation is she said, your rage and your grief are your hunger for justice. Mm -hmm. And that's you, that's your body, and that's yourself telling your, you that there's a reason to feel these feelings because we're in a moment where that is an appropriate <laughs> reaction. Um, and so I think of the work that I'm doing now and the work that we'll maybe talk about a little bit as being about processing those feelings um, and the many other feelings. So a lot of the work is about healing um, and healing my own relationship as a person who um, is in Minnesota because my ancestors came here as settlers. Um, they they settled into stolen land in northern Minnesota and um, made their life um, doing a lot of extraction-based industry. So my grandfather was in logging and then he was a miner. Uh, my grandmother and grandmothers were the ones who sort of um, helped our family survive that est extraction economy by caring for children and caring for families. So those kinds of themes come out in the work um, and I think we'll have time to talk about that. So It's going to be an exciting conversation. <laughs> now, Nan, you're probably the most known, but your journey, it sounds like, as uh, Shania talked about, her expression, her emotion is all about the body. So yeah, we'd love to hear more about how you've come on your journey. Yeah, thank you, Shania, thank you. Um, 
I was trained in classical Indian dance, and that is not how I dance right now. So I would like to request that you share, that you do something with me. Um, if you would just make sure you have some space with your arms. And just, um, you can hear me, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so right hand goes over. Left hand goes over. Right hand opens. Right hand goes over. Left hand goes over. Right hand opens. Right over. Left over. Long. Right over. Left over. Long. Go to the left. Left. Right. Circle. Long. Left over. Right over. Long. Left. Right, long, last time, left, right, long. Okay, breathe deep. Takes energy, yeah? Oh, yeah. We can't see you and they can all see us. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Um, I just wanted to do that because as a dancer, I think a lot about energy. And energy is not this, you know, neoliberal thing that wafts around in the energy, you know, I clean my energy. Energy is a real material force. It's that which powers our action. And um, I think about how, as a dancer, when I'm exhausted or when I'm, you know, when I'm doing a lot of these big, large movements, I breathe, I breathe deep. I breathe liberally. And... I am sure at some point our ancestors would never have thought that you would have to buy, pay for water. It was a natural resource. When we sweat and, you know, we all, you know, there's a lot of sweat falling on the floor and we're exhausted, we're thirsty, we drink water, right? So is there going to be a time? And there is actually a time. I think you know that when we take flights, you are sometimes asked for um, carbon credit or something like that. There's a, you know, so airlines apparently plant, for us to not feel guilty about flying, plant trees, you know, which are not very seldom trees that are meant for that ecosystem, but trees that, that, go quick, that grow quickly in some part of the world. And then the farmers are dealing with the after effects of that of the soil erosion and other things that happen as a result of that. So I, I come to the work I do because I understand that the body is at the center of all of these crises that we are manufacturing. Um, they're not natural crises, they are, they're the result of nature being completely disrespected. Um, at the same time, the great benefit and the great blessing of being in Minnesota is that we have amazing um, indigenous leaders here with whom we have the, you know, like I want to bring, bring, remember and celebrate the work of Janice Bad Moccasin, who is a long time, a long time friend and partner who reminds us, who works with equine therapy and reminds us of the power of the land and, you know, the plants that are medicinal all around us. Sharon Day, who leads these long river walks all along the length of rivers, because she reminds us, sometimes we have to do the work in policy, but we also have to relate to these things, not as, you know, not as a river, but as my relation, as a relative, as a family member. Through people like that and other, others, I have come to understand the difference, the very clear difference between environmental work and environmental justice work. And, the vital understanding of the lives of people, you know, both racially and culturally marginalized people, economically marginalized people, whose perspectives are crucial in bringing the angle of justice into environmental work. That's where my work comes from. Right on. Well, now that we've gotten everybody to, you know, feel the clay in their hands and we've heard from our, our, our speakers, I, I, I want to know one thing, it, I, and I, I'm serious when I say this. Is it really possible for us to work with Harmony Boone? Man, by nature, is a disruptor. And, and that's for anybody. And I just want everybody to just jump in and start talking. Don't feel that you have to wait. Well, I think that part of what I've seen is, is we as humans really have gotten far away from a land ethic and, and begun to view our natural environments as a commodity and, and what can we get out of it when, when really we need to pay very close attention to it and reclassify it as being a community and, and we are part of that community of the land and, 
and what can we do to sustain it and show respect for it. So, anyone else? I was going to say something similar to that, that the idea that we are separate from nature, that nature is an object and we are autonomous from it, is, is a very socially and culturally constructed idea. It's a very Western European idea. And so, Ananya, thank you for bringing some of the indigenous leaders um, into the room to help us think about that idea and how there are other ways of being. Um, and that idea that we are kin with the water that the water is alive, that it has a spirit. Um, those aren't just stories. Those are stories that shape the way we think and the way we behave and the way we relate. And so I would say that yes, it is possible, but it requires that we have to reconceptualize. We have to rethink everything. And that process brings a lot of grief and a lot of other you know, feelings. So. Mm -hmm. And a lot of inconvenience, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I actually don't think we are naturally disruptive. I, I, I do think it's the, it's the manufactured notion of what is progress. You know, um, I, I often think of, you know, I'm a, I, I, I was born a tropical person, so what it means to be in Minnesota and what it means to, um, you know, the heat, the heat, the idea of having heat in winter. I, th I think it requires so much thoughtfulness on how we live our lives, but it's also a shift, right, in how we understand. Um, Sharon um, walking, you know, you know, Sharon, so when we were, Sharon was walking with the, when she walked the Mississippi, um, she told me, okay, you have to carry the water for a little bit. And I was terrified. I was, oh my God, if I spill it, what's going to happen? It was, I was really nervous. But somehow during the process of walking and being charged with the idea of caretaking the water, um, I remembered that I had grown up with this notion of never calling a river by its name. Like we all would say, Ma Ganga, Mother Ganga. Not, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I had forgotten that. And I was like, oh, that's just my mother being, you know, always sentimental. But that's actually, that was actually part of the system. And, you know, I come from a history where of Chipko. Chipko is part of my history. I claim it. You know, women holding, I think it's, uh, I think people make, it's a, it's a name to be made fun of right now, this notion of tree hugger, hugger, but it's actually a real thing. People put their lives before cutting trees because women knew how to gather firewood to cook meals for their family. Mm -hmm. So that's not, it's not naturally being disruptive. I think there are ways around it. But I also think as we go back, you know, as with any process of decolonizing, it's a process. It takes time. Like you said, it's a process. Now, there's no mistake that this is a female-centric panel. And you're pointing out that it, uh, it, it is women that are the ones that lead this. So, so basically, it, uh, tell me if I'm right, uh, women have to be the canary in the coal mine when it comes to the environment. We are the ones that are dealing with it on the day-to-day -day basis. We're the ones who are dealing with it in our lives, with our children's lives. So we are the ones that are the most affected, so we are the ones that are doing the most work. Correct or no? I, th I think in some ways the way that we treat water, the way that we treat land, is very much like the way we treat women's bodies. I mean, we, we are, it's, a, it's a hierarchy and a cascading kind of effect, that way of thinking. That, um, and so I think that as women, you know, we've been subjected to some of those same processes in ways that we experience and, and that can guide us then in how we um, decolonize or rebuild those relationships. And I'm thinking specifically about this idea of how we relate to rivers. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I grew up in this little tiny town where the Mississippi flowed through and was um, slow enough and narrow enough that you could swim in it. And it wasn't, it wasn't a scary place to swim, but my mother had a story. She, you know, she never learned how to swim because when she was a girl, her brothers threw her into the water mm. and she nearly drowned. And yeah. so this was her story. And I, as I've gone around and done a lot of work with water, I've heard this story again and again, mm -hmm. and almost always from women, um, about a time that they were thrown into a river and what that meant for their ideas about themselves. And it was just recently that I was telling this story to someone and they said to me, um, <clears throat> another woman, she said, this is when we learned to turn against ourselves. Like this story about the river is not just about fear of water, but it's actually the moment where we ingest that story about ourselves being separate 
and ourselves being, and maybe this is not true of all women. You know, I think obviously we have differences and, and as a white woman, you know, this is a story that's very central to my conceptualization of who we were and who we are in this little town in Minnesota, right? Yeah. But that idea that we, we see ourselves as separate and this person said to me, what if when we were tossed into the river, we actually realized we enjoyed it <laughs> better than <laughs> being on the land with the people who would throw us? <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of want to go into Water Bar then, because you have a really unique relationship with water, but it is not what most people would think is the traditional. It is urban. It is a reflection of where the people are in the community and their relationship around the water. Um, what, so what we do at Water Bar is we're serving water. Mm -hmm. We serve people drinking water from different places. Some, most of the time it's public tap water. Sometimes it's water that's gathered from a special source. And it's just a place to begin stories. And it depends who's behind the bar and doing the serving of the water. Um, and it depends what the water is, and it depends who the person is who comes up, and then that becomes the beginning point. But the main thing we're trying to do is reconnect people to that idea that water has a source, mm -hmm. and there are stories that it carries. So sort of that idea that water has a spirit, or that it is something that we are related to. Um, and that comes out in conversation in lots of different ways, and it, it really depends. So sometimes we're talking about issues of urban infrastructure. Sometimes we're talking, you know, there'll be a water bar tomorrow night um, at the Weissman Art Museum and at the um, Capital Region Watershed, which is Mania Way, which is the version of water bar led by um, our friends at Healing Place Collaborative. So it's a Dakota water bar where the menu is um, helping to convey these ideas and language. and um, So it's very... Fluid. <laughs> uh, I want to come back to uh, what Ananya was talking about in terms of the body as the greatest messenger. Uh, does it really tell us your, what you do? It tells us what happens if we don't respect the natural world through through the body through motion. Um, I think the body is the is a microcosm of what is happening in the world outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I, think about, I think about breath a lot. Um, and when do we have access to air? You know, and that's both, and, and it's a moment, breath is something in which uh, political, social, economic, environmental violences converge. So Eric Garner's cry is also the cry of people, the indigenous, uh, people in Amazonia, in the Amazonian state of in Brazil, um, who are and the way in which the way in which uh, the powers that be push things back, right? So, um, so let's look at let's look at Amazon, um, the Amazon forest burning, right? Mm -hmm. And think about how, in fact, it is agro business that is pushing right. it back, right? Uh, farmers who are saying more food. We need food for our bodies to survive. We need food. So food is being, is being used as a way to burn down forest and livelihood. Um, this kind of setting, this kind of deliberate oppositional relationing of food, which we need to survive, and the forest is a false dichotomy. And um, people who, I'm not sure why people think that the, environment is expendable in that way, but clearly they do for short-term profit. Um, but also, I feel like when that happens, that respect, you always see it's about a disrespect. It's a complete notion of hierarchical humanity. You're, you're not, someone else is not as human as I am. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, and I, I feel like I understand my humanity really through my body. The body is the interface with the world. I understand. Uh, the body is as I interact with you, as I reach out to you, as I make eye contact with you, um, as I breathe with you or move with you. Um, so I feel like the body is a great, is a great uh, space to work through these ideas of what would happen when we can no longer breathe freely. Can we talk a little bit about the trilogy that you created, because I have the feeling it didn't start out as a trilogy, it started out as one performance, and then it, it just became something that really 
moved you to, to, to go beyond just that into three parts? It did, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, working with a really large group of women of color, I started to understand, you know, the environmental justice also because where I lived, um, in South Minneapolis, there used to be this thing called the arsenic triangle, where in the 60s there were these ar ar arsenic factories, and when they closed, they somehow they covered it up one way, but they somehow forgot to take into account that the wind blows both ways. So a lot of the top layer soil has still has arsenic in it. So, um, but I began to understand as to who, where you know, what about the location of that factory in that neighborhood? What about the intersection of race and class? Mm -hmm. Whose lives are more expendable? When was some of, the, where is some of the, you know, the, the, st uh, the, the toxic elements where, you know, there's this, this dumping of toxic elements in Abidjan um, at that time. And, you know, this constant, the way in which, the way in which factors that are used to marginalize and re-marginalize people always converge to create some of the environmental disasters of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started that, I realized that there were environmental stuff is so huge and how every environmental issue is, a, they are women's issues. Mm -hmm. They're the issues of folks of color. They are the issues of working class people. So there is really not a separation of what an environmental issue, environmental justice issue is, and what a gender justice or a racial justice issue is. They're always, always intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I, I felt like I had to develop it as a trilogy and it's continued to work, it's continued to be part of the work always because there is in fact not that separation. Um, and I also wanna say that um, I realized that there is a reason why activists, organizers on the field are sometimes suspicious of artists. It's because artists will sometimes take an issue, make a piece about it, and then it's done. And what I understood was, if I had to build a long-term relationship with organizers, I had to continue to do the work over time. So the trilogy was the first way to get really, to commit to that, commit to a foregrounding of some issues and then continue that, continue that over time. It also helped me, because I was working with an ensemble of artists, it also helped me avoid the cult of the individual, you know, which is a little bit of what is happening with Greta right now. Yeah. She's an amazing young woman, and kudos to her for speaking up cour courageously as she has. But there are many young indigenous and um, black, of color, young teenagers who are speaking up right now. So let's remember them as a caste. The cult of the individual belies the movement of which we are a part. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's interesting because I, I wanted to ask, because of Greta Thunberg, how, I mean, it's got to be hard to take the political away and talk about the personal and get away from the, the dynamics of what you said is manufactured, mm -hmm. uh, a manufactured discussion about uh, what environment is, manu uh, manufactured ideas about what the process is political ideas that are supposed to give us some sort of salve that we're doing something right, and that's not necessarily the case. The politics of it is just one aspect of it. It is more encompassing than just that, correct? Can you say more about that? It seems to me that when we get into the political discussion, people are looking for remedies that, they can, that makes them feel uh, some emotional uh, salve about what they're doing, mm. but it's not necessarily the long-term picture, and like you said, it's it's one voice and not many voices in the discussion as well. Yeah, I actually think what is polit it's actually that what you are calling political, I think comes from a very personal base, a very neoliberal thing of like feel, feeling good about, exactly. you know, I yeah. want something good. Mm -hmm. And that's the politics of neoliberal hope, the individual, where I can just shop at a very expensive co-op and then that's all solved. Right. That's not the point. And I feel good about myself. I've yeah. done something for it. Exactly. So that's not, you know, that's not the long-term solution. I think the organic food, growing organic food is super important. But how it comes to us, I think we have to really examine that process. And who, is, who has access to that? You know, like so many people are in, 
you know, the food desert is a very difficult conversation, very difficult term to put on on communities. Mm -hmm. But people are, you know, people are deliberately being kept away from what was the most, you know, originally. Again, remember the water we didn't we didn't know how to pay for. The food was something people grew and made and ate. And now people now I encounter young children who they who you ask them, oh, where did your where did your fries come from? From they McDonald's. No they have no idea that the potato grows from the gr in the ground. Mm -hmm. Or even maybe that it's a potato, that right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it seems like that idea, that disconnecting from those processes of life is part of that. And that it, we are consumers. We've been, become consumers. And so we consume politics. We consume it as an opinion. You know, it's an opinion we can take and then consume and put back. And we're not dealing with all of the things that go into making making it possible for us to even be here. You know, we talk about things at the level of what we can buy to be better, not what happens to our waste. Mm -hmm. You know, like we never talk about the fact that so many of the problems are problems of waste yeah. and the, even that, that we have waste. Yeah. You know, it's like we can, you know, our sh poop goes, we don't know where. Yeah. And when we use all these things, we just dispose of them because, but we made the right choice when we consumed it. So. Yeah. We're good. It was green. Yeah, and I think that that you know I've that that's something that I've if my thinking has changed on that over the years, right? Like because I was I was somebody who at one point in time thought that if I just shopped at the right places and knew a few things and then recycled and that I was gonna be doing my part, and that's that's not that's not enough. Um, and I think that's what some of these young people are saying that is coming through clearly to me is that, you know, yeah, we have to, we have to, we have a lot of hard conversations we have to have. I think we, we as artists are, are fortunate enough to, to be able to, to ground people like, as in all of you today, holding some clay that was, was hand dug and hand parched and, and how does that make you guys feel? Is it is there meaning into what you're holding? Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to open it up for questions uh, in a little bit because I'm sure you you have them. But yeah. I, I want I think in the immediacy, you are the one who can actually show how much your work is affected by any environmental change. If everything that you are dredging and sifting and pounding I'm sure you can tell over time that you've been in, in the uh, area where you are that the clay has somehow changed. Well, I had to take a good look at that question because um, to me the clay is a tangible kind of object and, and the only changes that I really notice are uh, the mineral component of yeah. it, seriously. But the thing I have come to terms with is Seriously, I've had to classify myself as a miner. I'm disturbing the soil. I'm out there with a shovel and a bucket. And granted, it's not on a large excavation um, where I'm tilling up acres and acres and commercially, you know, have a commercial operation going. But on a small scale, um, I'm going to have to do, do a little thinking on this one. You really do have, you have a license as a miner, or you just classify? No, I so just well. thought of myself as like, I'm, I'm doing soil disturbing activities, yeah. even though it's on my property. I mean, I, I could be digging a garden, or I could be digging a five gallon pail full of clay. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, where is, where is that balance between what I'm doing or sustainability issues as far as I'm going out and harvesting wild rice? We're going out and shooting a deer. Um, so much of my lifestyle is of that nature. And I'm eating off of my plates that I created and dug out of my yard. And, and we get it. That's a big kick for us. Um, but uh, anyway, is it hard? some food for thought. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I know that we talked a little bit about this. And I, 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 I want to keep it really simple. But... Mm -hmm. What is happening up there, what's happening in Ely, really does have a direct effect, n not just on your artwork, but on everybody's life up there. So the politics of it have in involved themselves in your work, whether you yeah. want it or not. Oh, yeah, it's there. It's there. It's, it's pretty thick. And, and um, you know, our, our community sustains itself really well with 
a variety of, of the small business and entrepreneurs that are there, and there, there is enough diversity up there um, and peacefulness to kind of keep on keeping on. People are pretty happy there, and I do have grave concerns over um, copper nickel mining, and uh, you know you can get me started on this issue, and I'm glad to talk more about it, but uh, I think it's a, that's a pretty scary deal. Um, I think that we're dealing so well to back up a little bit. I think that economically and um, environmentally, it's very symbiotic what's going on right now. But I think with the advent of copper nickel mining, um, I think it's going to be a, a monoculture and it will be a boom bust and it'll be over. That, that's kind of my outlook on it. So. Um, it's just too close to the wa watershed in the Boundary Waters Canoe area for me to be comfortable with. Yeah. So. Yeah. Shanai, does that come into the conversations that you, when folks talk about water bar? I, I really kind of want to get into the heart of that and understand how people understand the conversation in the communities uh, and that it's not just this esoteric thing that people talk about water and then they go on about their merry way and drive their Prius off into the sunset. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know about that. Uh, no, <laughs> um, well, the, I, I, are we going to show the slides at all? Yeah, we wanted you to tell us when you, you the, wanted to show the Because the project that I'm working on now that is kind of, it spins out of Water Bar a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's a separate project. And it's um, this is an image of Water Bar in our old storefront space. And I, I just wanted to show this because um, I think it's important to understand that the Water Bar project is um, not just... A, a pop up where we serve these flights of water, but it's actually a, a, a community project. It's a project where we're building a community of artists and others who are serving water in different ways. And so this is an image from just one of our community events. And not everybody in this room will know this, but this this is a, a slice of life that represents quite a lot of entanglements in our community. There are activists in this photo who are working on environmental justice issues around the Mississippi River. There's our mayor. There's a farmer who's serving water that's been contaminated in his well from agribusiness. There's um, DNR people. There's neighborhood residents who are learning about water. So um, we can go to the next one. So, so the project that I'm working on now is actually about mining, and it's about the history of mining on the Iron Range, but also the future. So this is an it's overburden over. Yeah, okay. this is the a project that's co a collaboration with a social scientist named Rupali Fadki, who teaches at McAllister, and she's doing research on narratives and how we make decisions in our communities politically, but also in our personal lives around issues like mining. And so this is an image of um, a mine inhibiting the hull rust mine, and that you can see how red the earth is, mm -hmm. and this is a taconite. They're mining iron ore here for taconite. And so you can go to the next one. And so what we're doing is we're using that mining waste, which is called overburden by the industry. It's waste, but it's earth that's been pulled up from the ground and, decide, and they decided it wasn't high enough grade. It's the stuff that gets cast aside, piled up, terraformed, and we use it as a dye. And we're using it to dye um, wool that was also gathered from that region um, from farmers who are doing regenerative agriculture practices. And so we're able to talk about these different materials as ways of in interacting with the land and water while people are felting wool pellets in their hands. Mm -hmm. So we've invented a wool taconite pellet. And when I tell this to people in the taconite industry, they're like, huh? Mm -hmm. But they slow down and we talk. And so you can, and so we set the, the project involves this pop-up workshop, which is led by women from the community, and they're teaching people how to make wool taconite pellets. Um, but we're also dyeing fabric that we've gathered from attics, mostly things that have been made by women over the last few generations. And then we're, in the next slide, we're printing onto it. So we're creating an iconography that speaks to the things, to our relationships with the land. And then those pieces are getting returned to the community as gifts. So we're giving them to different people. Um, they're becoming part of a conversation that we're having um, about the future. And then this is an image of some earrings that we made from the wool taconite pellets that I've been gifting to women who protect the water. Um, and just to kind of explain this circular way that we're talking about this material 
and then we're also doing narrative work. So this is a piece, and I can pass it, or I can brought a copy, I can pass around, but it was specifically to talk about the difference between the Twin Metals project in the Boundary Waters and the Polymet project. That there are two mining proposals for copper nickel, and they have very different, they're receiving very different attention, both from the government and the permitting, but also from activists and from people who live in the region, because they, they sort of fall along these fault lines of class and um, race because it involves indigenous um, rights to gather rice and to and to have clean water. So, and so these are utility flags that we made with that fabric, which we're using to flag these just these sites of disturbance in a kind of ceremonial way. I'm not taking photographs of where we're placing these flags, but I'm kind of placing them as I go, both around the mines, but also um, the Line Three oil pipeline, which cuts across the same region. I think that might be. Oh, and then we're also making flags. So those, these are flags that were made by children um, at a festival that we were at this past weekend. And I really wanted to just call attention to one thing, is this idea that to repair is to rebel. This is a theme that's come out of this project, that to do the work of repair, repairing our own relationships with land and water, and then also um, repairing those relationships in a communal way is a rebellion, an act of rebellion in, a, in an era when consumption is the primary way to be. Um, and then also this word justice shows up on there. And I just cut out a bunch of words and the kids can pick which words they want. And I think children are drawn to this concept of justice because a lot of them have yet to learn. Um, that, you know, they, they can say clearly, I have a seven year old and he's like, this is not fair. How can we do this to the river, or to, to other people? So he hasn't been conditioned yet to injustice, to accept injustice. And so I'm, I'm, I'm helping, <laughs> I'm invested in helping the children find their voice <laughs> right now, so. Mm -hmm. Children are so pure, but adults, for, this is more of a, uh, it can be not only scientific, but a spiritual reawakening for people. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to really understand how dance, because dance is in, usually in a, a hallowed hall, a private place, uh, how dance and how, you know, where, where this is more tactile, hands-on, how dance really gets people to o open emotionally to what is happening for environmental justice. This is my favorite thing to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so dance is, you know, dance is a very difficult discipline. Yes. It doesn't always happen inside theaters. Um, it happens everywhere, I just wanna say that. But, you know, dance is the one practice that is, is difficult because it leaves behind, as you say, nothing. So, you know, you put years and hours and hours of creating something, and it's in that moment of witnessing, of shared witnessing and performing, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. Just like the largest social movements of the world would change the world, right? Mm -hmm. At the moment, the moment, it's a time-based practice. It's what happens in that moment and it's done. But in that, dance is inherently anti-capitalist because you cannot extract the dance from someone's body and say, look, here's a dance. There's no such thing as a dance. It's only dancing, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, yay to anti-capitalist practices. <laughs> <laughs> plus and there's one. also... <laughs> what? I said plus one for that right here. <laughs> Yes. Um, there is just no, the other thing is also because dance is never the same, you know, in, it's, it, it refuses um, a certain kind of stabilization. Um, so it reminds us of process of, of growing, becoming, and also decay. So, mm. you know, it's part mm. of, it's because it's a body-based practice that it's like the earth. It's constantly in change. Um, so I, I also, but the great thing about dance is also the ability to articulate, I think, passion and story. Um, I think, Shanai, you were saying that the work is not in the, it's not just, it's a place where people can story. So I think about the practice of storying, making stories, not, you know, Jack and Jill went up the hill kind of linear stories, but the ideas of stories woven together with memory, with fragments of imagination and, you know, in the invitation to imagine when there is darkness, I think is the most, uh, is the most 
is the most powerful practice because that is the that is the practice of hope, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is what people always want to curb. If you, curb, you know what fascist fascism always wants to curb. If you can imagine difference, if you can imagine a different world, suddenly you've got power in your hands. And I think dance is that kind of for me. Dance is that kind of practice because I can put emotional, physical, all of myself into it mm -hmm. with all of my passion. And maybe I can show this one, uh, please, thing. because um, I uh, currently I have. It's the just breathe one. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, this is a. This happened in a parking lot. Um, I work in, uh, in an institute for performance and social justice. It's a collaboration with Tony the Scribe. And where was this? This is in a parking lot on University Avenue, uh, just across from the Institute for Performance and Social Justice where I work. Okay. So the Rondo community was a very successful African-American community and it was cut in half by the building of 94. And, um, you know, people have serious economic, social health issues from being not being able to breathe. So this is a project called Just Breathe. This was a nine hour long all okay. night project. Oh, the one time thing? Uh, oh. And you know, it'll, it's slowly what happens is this glass box keeps, yeah, it's okay. The glass box fills with smoke mm. and you know, the dancers put on a mask and then the mask itself is gets hidden. So yeah, that's good. That's a good place to, so you can see. And then the, the community members, audience, were invited to write on the wall what they, what is a way to, what they can do. But people, this disappearance of people mm -hmm. is important. For those of you who don't know, uh, back in the 1960s, the Rondo neighborhood, was a predominantly black neighborhood, but a highly professional neighborhood, uh, and uh, the decision to send 94 down the middle of it split it in half and really decimated the community. So if you hear about the Rondo Day parades, that's what they're celebrating. They're celebrating the history of a community that was decimated by 94 because none of the community was asked. The highway was just built through a, what was considered a poor neighborhood of, of no consequence. A great book to read is uh, by Evelyn Fairbanks. I don't know if it's still in print. You probably get it on Amazon, but it's called Days of Rondo if you want to learn more about the story of Rondo. And I, th I think so many env environmental injustice, so much environmental justice, injustice, <laughs> um, is based on that idea that certain people will take, will take more risk with their lives. We'll put these... Um, will put things onto those people in those communities. And it, clearly that was not a truth, that that was just a poor community nobody cared about. Because there is no just poor community that nobody cares about. The people who live there, live there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we have to talk about these things in an honest way, that it's not an accident that the people of Flint you know, have exactly. have that happen. These are by this is by design, because our system, the capitalist system, requires that there be sacrifices so that the rest of us can live comfortably and pretend that our waste goes away. It goes somewhere. Well, that's our, where it goes. Government right? considers expendable losses, right. things, that, right. losses that are acceptable. And so I think that's why it's so important that we have these personal stories and these relationships and that we build through art and story this idea uh you mentioned kind of storying and i heard it robin wall kimmerer talks about restoriation and the idea that we have to bring these stories back into consciousness if we're going to be able to live in a different way mm -hmm. i really believe that that's some of our work yeah. as artists yeah. I, I just question why as a society we we have created these divisions of us and them and and what can we do about it to to mitigate more of these issues? Why why are they keep unfolding all the time? There's one thing after another. There's the pipeline. There's Flint. There's you know the, the 94. It, yeah, and because it's profitable for the people who are designing that system, and and it's yeah. comfortable for a lot of us, you know. So you remember that there was a leaked memo by, written by the head of World Health WHO at some point about how certain community it was okay to dump toxic waste in some communities because uh, you know, life in the 
third world was less valuable than mm -hmm. in the first world. Remember, that was in I think it was in the 1990s, I think. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. There was this memo that was leaked anyway. Is it the case that I, I, I've been here in the Twin Cities since, since 1990, and one of the first things I said to folks here is this, that I feel that Minnesota is uncomfortable with the reflection that it sees in the mirror because it is constantly evolving, and some people are uncomfortable with seeing other people as who they are, that they are a shared experience in this life world. You talked about changing shift culture. Truly, how hard is that going to be in a place where people see themselves in a fixed identity and refuse to change how they see the way they are evolving in the how the community is constantly growing and changing and bringing in more people, which means the face is changing. How do we do that shift in culture when there is such resistance as to wh who, who we are, what our identity actually is? Is the schism too great? I mean, I think those are changes that happen on a very individual and personal level. And I know they're possible because I've experienced them. Mm -hmm. And so that that continues to encourage me to try to create spaces where people can have these, it's, it's not just difficult conversation. We say that a lot, but it's something else. It's a transformation that happens when you start to realize certain things things that you've always thought were true aren't true. Mm -hmm. And that those are things... That can be... That can yeah, be it can. Things. And so I think in some ways, I'm not... As an artist, when I talk about shifting culture, it's not necessarily to make other people believe something else. It's to create a space where they can go through that transformation. It's like being a hospice worker or a doula. You know, you're sort of in the, in the, in the realm of helping people through a change because that's going to happen. Because it's, it's not... A f it's not our imagined, we didn't just make up a story about the world changing. The world is changing. Mm -hmm. And so people are having these realizations and they're coming to them at different speeds and with different levels of gravity about what it means and what they're willing to, to do about it or, or are they gonna just like sit in the fear of that? Um, and it requires a change of, of our sense of self-identity for a lot of people, I think. Especially, I think, for white people and for people who are comfortable with the status quo because it isn't going to be this way. I mean, it's a, I, I really believe it's all collapsing and we're just kind of taking different speeds with our realization about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean that in a pessimistic way. Well, it is pessimistic, but I mean it in a sense that we have work to do to, to land somewhere. Mm -hmm. so. But it's not, just, it's not just white people, it's people of color right, who have right, been right. told that they aren't worthy of having something yeah. better. Yeah, and I guess the I The conditioning can't, of that too yeah, as well. Yeah, and I, 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 I can't speak for that experience, but I do, yes, I hear that. Yeah. But it's going to, we're all going to be, you know, if this 30 years of life, 30 years of humanity left has anything to it, it's it's pretty much out of our hands if we mm -hmm. don't, you know, we're either going to get there or we're not going to survive, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think people who can afford it will maybe go and live on Mars or somewhere else. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. just, that's just what's going to happen. It's, it's coming. It's the pace is so much quicker than it's we It's happening can. faster and faster right every day. And, mm -hmm. and I also think there's a lot of wisdom about how to live with that kind of change um, that we ignore. Mm -hmm. And I think about that and, um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time in the Iron Range in northern Minnesota and in these little towns and communities where folks are um, thinking and talking a lot about the economy, about what to do about the mines, or also about the public health epidemics that are in this place, right? I mean, there's an epidemic of domestic violence that mostly impacts women and children. There is an epidemic of opioid addiction. Mm -hmm. And this is everywhere, right? It's not just mm -hmm. rural communities, mm -hmm. but and so, you know, there's a lot of talk about that sense about, you know, identity and it's hope and fear are so much a part of how we imagine the future and the choices we have. And I, I think that there's something really important about recognizing our interdependence yeah. that happens in some of these spaces where, you know, we've been kind of, many of us have been conditioned to see ourselves as independent and that we, you know, our, our personal trajectory is our own and, you know, it's that all these things impact that. But once we start to realize how interdependent we are, there's a, there's a piece of, about that that's very much grieving the loss of that old story, but it's also, there's a lot to, 
you know, when you sit around a fire and you're eating food that you've harvested from the water and you're hearing stories about how that's been done over time, um, you start to get a sense about your place that I think is ultimately a deeper and more human connection. And once people experience that, I think that that starts to have that effect of changing a culture or changing a, the way that a community imagines its future. I want to open it up to you. You guys have been really patient and sitting and listening, and I know you have questions, so let's have at it. You know, as a, the word reporter, you know, means we always ask questions, right? There's no such thing as a stupid question, so questions are very important. If there is none, we will continue on. Yeah. I think what I hope is to just give people the opportunity to to work with the clay and and just hold a piece of the environment in their hands and connect with the land on more of a spiritual level, a meditative level, and feel grounded and be given a foundation that they can take with them and hopefully implement that groundedness wherever they are, whether they're coming back into a busy metropolis or whatever, but just to hold on to a respect for the natural simplicities that this clay offers kind of more on a molecular level. I think that's one of the reasons why people are attracted to your work, because they feel a closer connection right. to the earth. It's something that they can hold on to and still feel right. that they have done been a part of your journey to make it, create it, shape it. I think one of the most uh, uh, popular th pieces that people seem to be attracted to are uh, indigenous clay coffee mugs. Because a coffee mug is a really, can be a really personal item. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're holding that. You know, you're just, you're starting your day you're in, in whether that's, you know, going to be a, a fast-moving fun day or an a introspective day or whatever, it's, it can really set the tone. And I know that I always just have a bunch of mugs sitting out and I gravitate to one or the other to, to kind of start my day. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm hoping you're all kind of exploring and feeling tactily and working with the minerals and... Uh, picking up on, on the land and the foundation that this indigenous clay has to offer you. Shania, what I found interesting with the, the, fo the photos that you have, the, the, the water bar and everybody there, there seemed to be much more of an intimacy in the fight that has not been there before. I mean, I, I'm a child of the 70s. They gave us earth flags and earth shoes and just told us to make symbols, but there was no human real con connection. What I see in these pictures is people really understanding and really feel a connection to being all as one in this fight. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot lately about the importance of visiting as a way of being. And I've heard this from, uh, again, indigenous leaders and artists about the way of building a community or of creating those relationships as being this kind of slow visiting um, without an agenda in a sense that, you know, we, I think a lot of us spend a lot of our time on a clock. You know, we have an hour meeting and it starts at this time and it's mm -hmm. done at this time. And so I think anything we can do to create spaces where we slow down, mm -hmm. right now it seems like especially important because everything is telling us of the urgency of time. Yeah. And it is true. But sometimes I think that the, that urgency is actually to slow down in order to be able to recognize each other. Mm -hmm. That's really what that is, is like recognizing who's in this room with you, who's in this community with you, who shares this place um, before we go ahead and decide what we're going to do. Because if we just decide and go ahead, then we're perpetuating a lot of the same inequities because the same people will be setting that agenda that have been and... 
I yeah. think when we're allowed to follow our natural rhythms, a, a little story, I went on a, a two-month Canadian canoe trip this summer, and we never looked at a watch at all. And we just were governed totally by our natural cycles and our natural rhythms. And it was just such a wonderful experience. Not that my life is governed by um, a clock as it is, but this was kind of taking it <laughs> one step further. Mm. I, was, I just highly recommend it to anybody who wants that experience. It was wonderful. With the performance that you, you did, Ananya, how many of the people that were witnessing also wanted to share their stories with you once they saw that? It seems like it's such a natural communication, a natural way of getting people to really speak their truth. How many people came up and shared their own personal stories or wanted to be a part of what you were doing? A lot, a lot of people, you know, people are, um, people work with, diff are comfortable with different modes of communication. So mm -hmm. a lot of people would write on the, you know, so we, they would write on the sides of the box when mm -hmm. it was filled with smoke and you could no longer see the person. And then we would document all of that. Some people felt more comfortable sharing stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's about, you know, it's about what people feel comfortable with. I think a yeah. lot of the elders really wanted to share their stories and their experiences. And um, I wished I wished we had a larger, um, you know, we, I wish we had more resources to make an oral history project about those stories mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. they remain. But I know that there are websites and ways. It just is that these histories are not taught. So when we don't have these histories, people don't know their, these histories, then we actually don't know what could be, what was possible, what existed, and what, and how actually this idea of progress has disrupted what used to be there and what was very you know, it was very successful in its own way. It's, is it right now that we have to get the message out to people that there's no either or? It's not about jobs. It's not about the environment. It's all this is about because we only get one shot at this, and it's all it's we're all one part of this. So it's not an either or process anymore. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. but so it is with so many politics around the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, across the world, you see so many. Right now, there's a big, big, big sort of movement towards fascist movements. Yet people who are now, who are fascists, were once oppressed, colonized, completely taken advantage of. So how can we speak to m those multiple histories and hold those stories in, the, in our hands at the same time? It's the nature of our times mm -hmm. also. I'm going to come back out here again one more time and see if you guys have any questions that you have of our panel. Wow. Come on, you guys. Does that have to be a question? Yeah. Yes. So um, in, in this institution, we, we work with a lot of folks that are dominant people or young people who are have new ideas and new places to go that, are, that don't necessarily want to walk the path that's set forward, yet this is truly about setting forth the path of what you're supposed to do. What's the best way to break down Sure, I can start. I think that the interesting thing is to realize that the, you know, the um, new things oftentimes are what, you know, we don't want to fetishize the new as the next thing, but we also want to be recognized that as things shift, we have to shift along with it. And some of the ways in which we did things, they don't work anymore. Um, I, you know, I was teaching in class today about this community, Kiki, you know, this, this community of black and Latino queer transgender community who have, you know, who, they have their work, their struggles over the years have made our, have finally made their way into the mainstream where we are actually, where we're actually, we understand gender and sexuality as shifting, right? Mm -hmm. As having porous boundaries. We're, you know, it's pretty mainstream to say, oh yeah, I use she, her pronouns or they use they, them pronouns. Mm -hmm. But it was the work of those companies. So it seems new to us, but actually it's been the work of many people before. And the, we can't continue in the way we were before. So, you know, like that, that dichotomy of new and old 
is something we have to maintain all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would say that one of the experiences that I had while I was an undergraduate at the university was doing an off-campus HECUA program, um, which was, I think, it, it's an internship program where you're working in community and you're also getting to know some of the community organizations, and that opened up a lot of possibilities for me. Um, and then I also think that this was in something that you were saying, but I can't, I'm not sure exactly where this connection fired in my brain, but the idea of finding your elders and finding the lineage of the thinking that you're a part of. So mm -hmm. recognizing that w everything we're doing is built on the work of others. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a different way of thinking about your path, mm -hmm. which I think can then reverberate through the work that you do um, going forward. So Because they're not in opposition. For some reason we have this, this challenge between old and new, young and old, and, and, and it's not. It's the learning from each other in order to, co to collaborate and create something new. Mm -hmm. It's the evolution of who we are. Yeah, yeah. elders or teachers, because I also am, as a mother, I'm starting to recognize how much I learn from my children yeah. and being around them that, you know, just kind of having an intergenerational sensibility about learning and about the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think for myself, too, it's, it's remaining open to all things and all people and in just following your heart and and just going for it. I, I left a really lucrative business in Minneapolis as an illustrator and went up to Ely and was working folding t-shirts. But I mean, I'm here today and I'm a potter. <laughs> I would have never done that had I not just said, okay, I'm gone. And I think that's just on a side note, that's the a lot of the majority of the people up in, in my area of the world is people who've just said, I'm, I'm out of here and I'm just going to go back to the land and make life a little bit simpler. I think everybody kind of goes there. And, and I don't think there's any particular age group when you kind of realize that you set yourself on a journey and then all of a sudden you look and go, nah, nah. That that's not that's not making it for me right now. I need to reevaluate and stop and really find who I am in this and what is making me happy. And I think a lot of times we only do that for limited things. And now we're getting to a point where we are seeing what is happening to our planet and what's happening around us every day and going, No, I've I've got to step up and say something. And I think that's part of the reason why we're all here, right? It's, and it's all small steps. It doesn't have to be big, grandiose things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the back here. Ooh, that's a really good yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like we all probably need to answer yeah. that question. I mean, one of the things I, I'll just, as a kind of concrete example, just thinking about the, the pop-up workshops that I mentioned and taking them, um, I, I, I really try to be welcoming in the sense that um, when we do these in public, like on the street in a town up on the Iron Range, I try to make eye contact with everybody who passes and say hello. And I know that some of them are going to keep walking some are going to stop and engage and have a conversation. But the fact that we had this moment of recognition is something that I realize that the more that I've done it, it doesn't happen there. And it's, it was especially, um, this is a community where there are uh, there is a lot of poverty in that downtown. And there's a lot of Native women who live in that town who when you know would say to me that I could tell by the way that I was talking, they were talking to me, that nobody looks them in the eye mm -hmm. and says hello. Like a lot, a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. They're invisible. And so just that kind of like, that sort of welcome where it's, it's welcome, but it's, it's unsafe in the sense that it's, it's creating a condition that is unusual for that place and time and for a lot of the people in that conversation. Um, and then the pushing piece is that I think I'm always trying to push myself to do that in different places where I feel particularly uncomfortable. So I did a pop-up on Sunday at a church. I'm not a church person. I don't think I've been to church since <laughs> I was a kid. But they invited me. And so I brought the space there. And I went 
and I sat through the church service and I took notes and tried to glean what I could from what was being shared, but it was definitely the space of dis being uncomfortable for me. Um, but what it did was it brought me into conversation with a community um, that I that I did ultimately want to talk to. So I don't I don't know that that answered your question, but it's a good question. That's I'm going to be thinking about that question some more probably after we're done here. Just stretching your comfort zone, I think, as an artist is is, is challenging enough. But when you're trying to engage people, it, it, that is the biggest question: How far do I push without alienating people? Um, you know, am is my level of comfort with this conversation? really taking somebody beyond what they are capable of of really embracing at that point. I, I think that's always going to be a challenge for, for artists. But I, I, but I, do we have a hand up? Did I, I was turning real quickly, okay. But I, 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 one of the things that I am curious though too, but when the message comes from women of color, how much is it accepted or how much of it is it rejected, you know? And, and I ask you because you're the only woman of color here on this panel that I can t ask that question. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I, I have really had to meditate on love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I do think they people low, are capable of a lot more than, uh, people are capable of a lot more than what they think, you know, of abandoning useless ideas of division. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I also, you know, I, I always say upfront, I'm not a liberal. I'm not for all free speech. I'm I'm committed to justice, which means certain kinds of hate speech I will not stand for. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a liberal. I'm a prog progressive. All right. That said, though, um, I feel like I work. It is not, especially you know, I'm a professor. I'm an educator. It is not the fault of young people that they were brought up with ridiculous ideas. It's not their fault. It's a system. It's an educational system that has failed them. So I will not disengage. I will not disengage. I will come to them with love. How much are they going to keep refusing me if I come to them with love every day? That's the only thing. I know that in this battle for justice, we need everyone. Mm -hmm. We need every single person. So I'm going to keep coming as much as I can, especially for young people. All, I'm going to keep coming for all of them with love. Sometimes it'll not work, you know. Uh, my great... Uh, mentor Sonia Sanchez says sometimes you know you'll drag people over your shoulder for years and years sometimes they'll come sometimes they'll be unwilling many years later they might come to you and say hey I remember mm -hmm. so you know and when you're a parent you really know that mm -hmm. <laughs> one of the things that I thought really interesting when I first came to this community that the Phillips neighborhood took power uh, and gave it back to all of its communities when fighting the, the liquor stores that were in the community. They, it, back in the early 90s, the Phillips native neighborhood was inundated with liquor stores. I mean, it was just, it, it was ridiculous. I mean, people just, their lives were just in, in tatters on the streets. And so they took it, they took the community back into their own hands. But instead of, you know, trying to get out there and stump people, the thing that I thought was revolutionary in what they did is find out where to meet people at their most comfortable place to have this discussion. So they started having a quilting session for people that were in the Hmong community. There were powwow sessions for people who were native in the community. There was church-based uh, uh, soul food dinners for people in the black community. And really taking the message to people where they lived. Is that where we're back to now is taking these old ideas and bringing them forward again in order to make people get more comfortable or we just we can't do that anymore we don't have the time we've got to go straight to the to the matter now i think the latter i yeah. i just jump in on that i think we you know and part of the problem is that while there are we all need to hear why this the salute the 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 issue needs to be filtered differently for for the African American community, for the Hmong community, for the we all need to know that. Mm -hmm. While they can make, while we are still in decision making, we need to know how we need to constantly retool, re-navigate the the strategy differently, mm -hmm. so we understand difference. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Oh, I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? statement 
ideas, thoughts? How do you feel about today's panel discussion? Yes. sure that we can use art in a way that really makes sure that everyone has a voice in this. And I think that when we have, when we make sure that everyone has a voice, I think that everyone means that they can be a part of the solution. Um, so I guess like making sure that it's sustainable, making sure that we can get this collective like And that it lasts. Okay. I think I, huh? You already know, I think. Huh? What? But it's like, I, think, I bet like you already know because the way you articulated it was so clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that is a desire that I recognize, you know, that to want those things. And I think one of the things that um, someone said to me recently that really, like, made me, I thought about it for weeks and weeks after, was this idea that, you know, why, why did I feel that I needed to, that I needed to be the one to do all of those things? And it's not that we shouldn't want to do those things, but there's also a point of questioning also, what is your work and what isn't your work? And in some cases, I think that we, um, a lot of us are brought up to think that we need to be saviors or we need mm. to have, mm. we need to have that be the end point when there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done just mucking in to how how complicated our lives are and doing a lot of work about like what brought you here and what are your experiences and where are there points in your life where you've learned important lessons that you can share or um, changed your perspective in a way that might help others see that potential in their lives in, instead of necessarily thinking that it's about an external Thing. Um, because I think more of us being self-aware and understanding our, our own potential is, is part of how collectively we're going to get to a different kind of imagination about the world. And I think art is a really good way of knowing yourself too. You know, I, th I think I learn a lot when I write or when I create because I'm spending time in my body <laughs> and my head. And so I think having an artistic practice of any kind, whether it's journaling or collage, I mean, you don't necessarily have to even show it to anyone, that there's benefit to, to, to that creative practice in, as part of understanding. I don't know. No, I, I totally agree, too. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a real, it can be just a real meditative thing, and, and part of that journey is, is, not, is, is what's going on along the way. It's not your final result and your final piece, and oh, wow, that's great, but um, it's, it's your journey, and you can just take that metaphor through your life. And then maybe you're more prepared in a way. You know, that I, th I think a lot about long arcs. Like, I liked your idea that you do a trilogy because it's helping keep you engaged in a struggle that you really are needed in and that you want to be part of. And so it's how can art also be, an, an artistic practice also be a way to keep yourself engaged um, in these things that are so difficult? Because there's points along the way where a lot of us will um, step back from the hard work, especially if we're able to. Um, if we have a choice. And a lot of people, rec that's recognizing that a lot of people don't have a choice. They're in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think using art as a way to keep yourself in that trouble, troublesome space <laughs> um, long enough to, to form a community, to build alliances and relationships of understanding. Um, and uh, there was a word I heard the other day that's not allyship, it's like co-resister. 
you know, being mm. like a, a co-resistor, being someone who is alongside others who are in, in struggles, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Like, really <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? And how, this will be an easy question, how would you respond? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm>, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> you know, I have a response because I think that our work, there's two kinds of response. One is um, people don't come to, the, to people don't change. Uh, because of money, and it's change doesn't make people famous. They come because they're moved. Mm -hmm. And facts and figures are important, but they don't always move people to the extent that I think revealing the depth of our humanity mm. and that emotional, mm. emotional articulation does. Yeah. Well. At the same time, I wanna say, as artists, it is not our job to change policy. It is our job to be provocators. So we ask questions that we can then engage in conversation with. We work with partners in policy making. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank yeah, you. Touche. I, th I think also something that you know we've been talking a lot about at Water Bar, and it's been echoed in a number of our other partner organizations, is this idea that um, culture is it's like we can't see it. It's the water we swim in, right? Um, all of these things being part of our, our culture and our lives. And if you want to change people's, if you want people to change their behavior and you want policy to shift, culture has to shift first because policy, I also think policy does not make those does not make culture, no. right? And so in a, in a way, engaging with art and environmental justice is a way of shaping the culture that is ultimately going to influence behaviors and policies. And maybe it's more circular, you know, maybe it's not linear at all, but I think that there is a really important place for being able to work in story, work in these in more intangible things that does have a direct impact on what people can imagine, what they're willing to do, what they're moved to do. Um, and so that's a long, you, you wouldn't snap that one out at them like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for being part of the panel today. Uh, it was amazing to hear from you all. And I really want to thank you for taking part and uh, playing with your clay. <laughs> we still have some uh, wet naps over here if you want to wipe your hands off. You want to hold on to your clay because it's going to make you think about this discussion. Take it home and share what you heard here today with people that you know that are still thinking these questions or are on the path of starting to think these questions. Get them thinking. Make some radical change in your own community. Be subversive within the machine. Right. Got to be in order to make change happen. If you're not interested in taking your clay home, there's there's a bag by the door. <laughs> and if you are, take if your you are, wet nap I'd home. I'd rather you keep it <laughs> and keep, keep the clay and, and let it be, you know, uh, a memory trigger. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if it's going to go in the garbage can, put it in this garbage can right there because I will take it home and recycle it. And give yourselves a round of applause. Yes, please also join me in thanking Ananya, Shanai, Nancy, and Robin. We're so happy that you are all here today, and, and thank you for everything that you shared with us. <laughs>